All right, welcome. This is uh, another episode of Gardening Unplugged here at Juniper Level Botanic Gardens. My name is Jeremy Schmidt. I head up the research and grounds departments here. And today I'm going to be talking about berm gardening with rocks. So it makes it a lot more fun. So what I'm going to do is show you a recent installation. And then as part of this, we're actually going to stack some rocks. But we'll need to do that over there. So there'll be a little bit of walking involved. Um, but I'll go through the basics here first uh, at this, what I call the paisley berm. It's a paisley shaped berm that we built just over a year ago. So the, the concept is pretty simple. Uh, most people know what a berm is. A berm is a raised hump of soil that uh, gives you great drainage. In other words, if we get a 10 inch rain, um, the water has somewhere to, to go, both to drain through, to shed off. Your, your plants are not sitting in water. Uh, it allows your plants more root run, so they can go deeper as they grow in response to air and water. Uh, but one thing that we're also doing here is we like to incorporate rocks into our berms. It allows us to have steeper faces. Uh, it allows us to have planting pockets, little places for, for often very small plants that would otherwise uh, get lost in the garden. You know, if you've got something that's only six or eight inches across, it might not play well up here with the bigger plants. So one of the great things about incorporating rocks is you've always got a place for those little tiny plants, a place to really appreciate small things, to look closer at your garden, to, to um, get that macro lens going. Um, another thing that, that boulders and rocks do in a berm situation, in a garden bed, is over here there are several rocks that are just kind of one at a time. And a great thing about having these sorts of rocks is it gives you a place to step in the garden. So even if they're not retaining anything, by having a berm that also includes rocks, it gives you a place to, to move through the garden. It also allows us to keep track of our plants. Even when rocks are not touching, whether or not they are, as soon as you take a picture of, let's say, these asphodelas here, and they go dormant and a tag is lost, as long as we can go back and see that picture, we can see that it was exactly there with that rock that hasn't moved much. Um, over the last few years. Of course, same rule applies for planting pockets. This berm was built about 15 months ago. It took five business days to build because we had 360 degree access with a, with a skid steer, with a, a diesel machine that was able to not only do the excavation to get through all this road gravel, but also to stack the soil up high, to mix the soil in the first place, 50% permatill, 25% native soil, which is a clay and a sand, depending on where you are on the property, and 25% uh, organic matter. Great draining, uh, but because we had a machine that we could stack it up with, uh, we were able to, to have the high ground, to have the rocks right here to stack them, and then pull the soil back down just with gravity. So it only took a few days with machinery. Without machinery, it would take a couple of weeks, you just have to throw the soil up high, one shovel full at a time. This is about 50 yards of soil, just for reference. So if you're ever looking to build a berm and you want to call one of the local landscape places uh, and buy soil, buy compost, hopefully buy permatill, um, this is about 50 yards of material. So that's two and a half dump trucks in many cases. This is eight pallets of stone all the way around. That side doesn't have as many stones and we just plan to cover that with plants. So it all works out well. What I would like to do today um, is give you a brief demonstration of actually stacking these rocks. What I'm looking for when I set it up, uh, what the goal is, kind of a, the, maybe a, an order to think through it that at least works for us, um, and how to maximize uh, the square footage that you have to work with. So it's about a six or seven hundred foot walk, but we're going to walk this way. I've got a pallet of stone set up. Um, I'm just building it right into the side of a compost pile, and we'll tear it down later. So this way. 
And feel free to ask me any questions you might have on the way. Absolutely it would. Yeah, then those planting pockets can be full of uh, uh, trilliums and rhodias and carex and all the little spring ephemerals that get lost easily in a garden. You can put them in the little planting pockets and they do very well. They do get lost at the ground level. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, is this considered a burn, like just, or just a raised bed? That's a good question. Yes and yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a raised bed. All, pretty much all of our beds here are raised. But again, this allows for water to be present, but not be totally saturated all the time. So that would be the best way to, to do it in a home setting, too. Absolutely, absolutely. I call these the bookends. This is recycled concrete here. Uh, these were put in about uh, three to four years ago. And this is technically a raised bed, a berm with rocks. You can see the plants are beginning to fill in. Yes, this is not irrigated here, not at all. And of course, that's, that's a decision that you can make as a gardener. Am I, yeah, am I gonna go xeric? And so as you're here today, knowing that none of this is irrigated, Take pictures of those tags. All of these plants are able to do without, they're, they're happy with our 50 plus inches of rain a year. We're gonna go this way, watch for traffic. You've got people driving away with our plants and they're so excited to get home that they might not be looking. So where do you guys get the concrete? Much of this concrete came from this property. As we expanded, yeah. we tore down a home that was here um, as a new home was being built and we uh, we broke it up and used it yeah. as we needed more we put an ad out on Craigslist we said we said you won't pay us and we won't pay you and we got a few loads like that um, anybody familiar with NC State horticulture probably knows Denny Werner uh, his driveways in there so we're gonna walk down here and take a right There's our pile of permatil. That's good stuff right there. We buy it by the transfer truck. Um, locally, of course, you can buy it by the bag and it's obscenely expensive. I believe that, I believe that Triangle Landscape Supply sells it in bulk, so dump truck loads. And currently they charge about 95 bucks a yard, which sounds like it's a lot of money, but in reality, you know, pea gravel is 60 to $80 a yard, and it doesn't do nearly what Permatil does, and I can explain more about it. So you get also to see our composting program. Here's a, a finished pile of compost. We've turned it several times, but I figure it's stacked up. I can just cut into it with the skid steer, bring a pallet of stone over, and I can do a demonstration. Number one, with, with berm gardening, when you're going to build up an area that would otherwise not be directly walkable, you're going to restrict access in some way because you can't drive a golf cart or a car over it, make sure you know what your traffic flow is. Where are people moving? Where are, are mowers and golf carts or cars moving? Where does the water flow? And that's something that in this uh, dynamic space, Sometimes when we get a big rain, I actually get some puddles here that, that persist. So in a garden situation, that's not good. Uh, it's not really good here either, but it's something to think about. So think about traffic flow. Think about what utilities, uh, existing infrastructure might be underneath it. Are you going to build on top of something that you really might need to dig up later? Um, so a um, you know, irrigation system. It's great to bury the pipes, but what if it breaks? What, what do you do? Electricity, um, fiber optic, may, you might need to run something later. Is this an opportunity, especially if you're renting a machine or if you're gonna have a crew come in, stack the soil for you, is this a good opportunity maybe to run a conduit under there? At uh, one inch conduits, about a buck 30 a foot. If you put some 10 foot sticks in and run a pole string through it, at any point, if you want to run electricity through there, fiber optic, you name it, um, just 
tie it to the string and pull it through. So it's a chance to do things that'll save you a lot of money and, and trouble in the future. Next, we've got to think about edges. You know, we're not trying to, to retain too much here, um, but what's so important for how the eye flows are edges. I have found that when I'm looking at an edge, my eye can follow a line or a curve even if most of the line is not even there. Like a dotted line, for example, or a line that has big indentations. But my eye is immediately distracted if I've got a curve that juts out somewhere. It just stops it. Everything, everything just stops right there. So when I build an edge, I want a curve that bends back as few times as possible. So think Nike symbol. That's actually a very good regular curve. Uh, a kidney shape, that's why you see paisley shaped berms so much, is it's a, it's a curve that very rarely changes direction. Um, just different ways of looking at a line. Here we're just gonna build one small curve. What I like to do are use these cheap flags. You can buy these at box stores, hardware stores. You can find them on Amazon. And I wanna stick them in here. So what I'm gonna do is just, generally this is the curve. I'm gonna put it up here pretty close. I'll put out my extents. So as far out as I wanna be, just a couple times. Nice thing about flags, you change your mind, just change where the flag goes. Okay, divide and conquer. I'll just keep splitting these in half. Who's stacked stone before? You have. Okay, tell me about it. Uh, I did a project in our front yard doing a berm. Okay. Yeah, the biggest problem that I had is trying to not try to light as much as possible. Okay. Which over time, the settling rocks outwards. Yep. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now is trying not to have a stock rock better to maintain their shape over time. I ran into that same problem in one part of the garden here about 10 years ago when Tony Avent, the owner, first turned me loose with 10 pallets of stone and oh, compost and everything else. I like to use compost as the mortar for the stones. But what I learned, not the hard way, but I certainly learned from watching it settle over time, it is important that rocks are touching each other or else the compost in between will, it'll settle and move and change. When you're cutting into these pallets of stone, of course, watch out for the pokey ends, the cut ends, but if that pallet is full of stone, be very careful as you're cutting it because you're going to have an avalanche. It could be a thousand pounds of stone or more coming at you. And that's not a good day. We're going to drop these down. Okay. The thing I like to do is really spray paint this line. You don't have to do this, but it's just a can of inverted marking paint. And I'll make a few dots. And I look, see if I can connect those dots. I can. If you don't like where a dot is, you just erase it. Move a flag if you have to. This is why, although, you know, I, I majored in landscape design. I learned how to draw it all out on paper, which is a great thing to know. But especially when gardening with stone, you'll find that all of your plans will change five times. Kind of like a rough draft when writing. So there's a nice regular curve. Another thing to think about is, this is not a great example, is the soil too high to start with? If it's too high to start with, then as the soil erodes and settles, your rocks will be kind of, they'll have soil under it visible down to whatever your grade is. And then those rocks will eventually settle through that or fall out. So what you would normally want to do is if you can set the, the bottoms of those rocks at least an inch or two under the soil, then you know that as things settle, they'll be nestled into the earth and they won't be unnaturally above it. All right, so we're gonna set our edge stones. I'm gonna look for rocks that have some part of 
even if it's a very small amount of the face, that matches the contour of this curve. And although I want my rocks to look like nature put them there probably, that first row, it is extremely important to make it look like a stone saw came through and cut that edge. Even if there are indentations, if there's anything that juts out or any curve that suddenly levels off and then starts again, the eye will notice it and you'll have to live with it. So this is pretty good. It's a little bit, that actually is a little too sharp there. Believe it or not, I'm going to use this edge. It also gives me a lot of choice, a lot of strength to stack on top of it. I'll flip it over. Not good because the rock's going to want to fall off of that. I might have to shim this, but we'll see. Not ideal. But I want to show you the most important part here is getting that first layer and the edges correct. Another thing is don't cherry pick. If you see the perfect stone, try not to get it. Try to just stack through your palette from what's closest to you to what's furthest away. If you can do that, it will look more natural because in nature, there is no cherry picking. It just, it just happens and it looks great. Yes, yes, definitely. This is not, unfortunately I didn't bring a shovel, um, but yes, this is up a little high. Level to the ground is great if you're in a situation where you'll actually backfill against it. In my own garden, I like to use that black plastic edging. And I'll usually go about a foot, 10 inches, something like that out from it and drop that in. That allows me a dead zone. You know, Bermuda grass, it, your Bermuda grass does not discriminate. It will invade any garden. If you cross this line, you, you get hit with Roundup or vinegar and soap or whatever you're using. But you can keep that at a distance with edging. This will work. I'm not too worried about getting this gap to close. It's not, not really important. All I'm looking at is, does it come through here? When I say that I'm not a perfectionist, but this layer, it's extremely important that it's very close. If you can get that first layer right, you have a tremendous amount of creative license in the future. So this is a, an obvious face here. It's got a slight, slightly convex. Notice how I'm not using my back. People say, put your back into it. I say, take your back out of it. Oh, Jeremy, you're so strong. <laughs> hey, what's up, Vlad? So that one works pretty good. Okay. Smart enough not to bring a shovel, but nice thing is I can cheat a little bit because the soil's up so high. Tuck it in there. Here's where the soil is being used as mortar. Not trying to pack it in there, but I am trying to kind of get rid of all the air pockets. Can you say you like these compost because of what you that because it's kind of stickier than just regular soil? I stack stone for the plants. So Whatever I put behind those rocks, I want to be able to grow stuff in it. And the compost is an obvious choice. In my garden, I like to mix this with about 50% permatill as well. Even if it's just the backfill, even if you've got a, a foot or foot and a half behind them where it's 50% permatill, 50% compost soil mix. What does the permatill, what, what does that offer? Many things. It is an expanded slate product. So they mine it out of the ground and they heat it way up. It pops and you have, um, it's, it's very porous, kind of like lava rock. Voles don't like it, yes. It has what's called a cation exchange capacity that is very high. So it facilitates the exchange of nutrients, kind of like nutrient uptake, um, much like compost does. But because it's porous like it is, that means there's always oxygen down in the soil. And uh, there's also humidity 
down in the soil while cutting humidity. So it's, it, it holds nutrients, it facilitates the exchange of nutrients, it makes sure that there's air in the soil, it makes sure that there's moisture in the soil. It is an outstanding product. I can't garden without it at this point. And it's a locally mined, it's mined um, near Gold Hill, North Carolina, and they truck it in. That's not bad, even though there's a big gap there. Again, that's okay. I'm looking at... Some of your low pH requiring things. But for the most part, Permatil itself isn't doing too much to change the pH of the soil, even though it chemically is up around 8, 8.5 pH. Um, but I would not mix it, for example, with peat to grow pitcher plants in. That's probably not a good idea. Okay, so we got those. I got four in. Let's go with a second level now. Again, I'm just trying to go through here. Thank you. And again, I'm, when I'm lifting the stone, I'm not going down here and picking it up. That's the worst thing you can do. It's not worth getting injured. What I want to do is come down, if I can lock my elbows into my knees, if I can get down here. My back is not actually being used right now. All of the weight is on my elbows, not on my back. It's on my legs. So I can come down here, offset my body, and I can actually bring it over here just with my legs. I'll set it up here. Let's see what we got. A lot more creative license on this level. What I want is something that's not going to kick forward like this. That's very important. And usually it's not that hard to find. There. That's actually really good. So that's not going to kick forward. And stack on top of that. I'm going to backfill under it, around it. I don't want air pockets. And there we go, level two. Okay. Again, I'm looking for that edge that might fit this edge. That's a good start. Once you stack a lot of stone, you start getting more of a creative feel for it. Like, can I really go in deep? Can I make a big pocket so I can put a three gallon plant right here, which I've done that many times. If, the taller you get, the more creative you can get. So obviously this is a pretty extreme example, but if I could actually come back here with bigger stones and leave this pocket open where there's actually a stone wall back here, you don't lose your edge, and, but you give yourself room to put something bigger or more new, unique or give it a more specialized specialized place. There's a lot of rules to stacking stone like running joints where you've got stone, stone, gap, gap, stone, stone, which weaken the wall. The higher you go with your rocks, the more room, the more that those rules will apply. I'm not a trained stone stacker. I just do it a lot. And like, like you've seen, you've seen what happens when they move. I like to stack stones so that they can move. That's the very best case scenario. Yeah, that'll hold. So I'm gonna pack that in there. Now what I've done too is, notice I've got a rock here and a rock here. I've got a gap to fill now. That gets difficult because now I have limited the number of choices that I have to stack the next stone. Very few of these stones will fit in that space. So if you can, try to avoid that or don't get stuck on it. If you've got a 20 or 30 foot wall and you can't find the rock for this spot, go somewhere else, start, start somewhere else. Don't, uh, don't get stacker's block, so to speak. Another thing is it's really easy to pinch your fingers. Know that the rocks are trying to pinch your fingers and any chance that they have, they will do so. So always, I don't know if we have any like doctorates in ballistics or anything here, but you start to see how they ricochet off of each other, how they settle, how they move. If you can get the rock moving and then just get your hands out of there, that's the best way to do it. I don't usually use gloves because I just can't feel the stone the same way. And I've learned my lesson the hard way a bunch of times. Do you have fingerprints? I do. I do. It's amazing, though. 
if I'm stacking for a few days in a row, I do start to lose them. Yeah, so that's, that won't, won't tip forward. It can move back, but that is because it's touching, it's touching the rocks next to it. It's touching this rock. Now, you can backfill the back of it. Just get up into there. There you go. Get that one too. So that'll stay. As you're stacking, you'd mentioned that your rocks were kicking out. They were moving a little bit. One mistake that a lot of people stacking rock or doing those little concrete blocks with the tab on the back is they'll stack a wall like this and then their backfill is, is right here. It's level with it. The very best and most natural situation is when your backfill is up here and it's coming down to it. It's easy to stack too tall in that the berm that I showed you by the brick garage. Notice how much taller that actually is compared to how high the rocks are stacked. That way you never get this situation where you've got rocks and you've got nothing at all. You always want that soil to be coming down to it as if it's about to fall off. Anybody want to try one? Go for it. I'll pull one off of here. Be real careful. You've got the same steel toes I, yeah. as I do today. So. Yeah. A little baby rock. Okay, I'll get you some options too. Yeah. That one's got a cool hole on it. I see two places for that one to fit. Yeah, that, that front edge is the right angle to fit the curve. So if it's a base stone, you could extend your base. Ah. Anybody else want to try one? Yeah, it's gonna be... It fits the curve very well. Yeah. It's actually very nice. Yeah. One thing to look at is if you stepped here mm -hmm. with a oh, kick it's forward, yeah. it's not bad. It's not bad actually because once there's another stone with it, you should be good. But that really fits that curve well. Yeah, and that would weight it down back here. Right? It would. Yeah, so if I drop some soil in here, pack it in. Let's pick a rock that will go with this one. The other thing about rocks is if they're touching on a pencil point thickness of a spot, they're locked. They're not moving. It's, it only has to touch in the smallest of spots to lock in. Unlike wood or, or other things that, that can break Rocks, if they're barely touching at all, they lock in. Well, let's look at the hypotenuse of this. That fits. But maybe we can be even more creative. So we don't have to put every edge out. Let's see if we can fit this. All right. Not quite. So that locks. That edge good. That's not moving. You can't step there, so you don't have to worry about that. We've limited our choices here, but if anybody sees a rock that'll fit there, try it. I'm gonna fit, pack this in. See what it does. Watch your fingers, we've got sharp edges behind you. I like to dig it out, stair step it. When you're when you're stacking down a grade, yeah. you can start start downhill if you can, okay. and work uphill. That way, every rock you put in can work with the rock below it as part of its own foundation. Okay. Um, maybe dig out a little yeah, step. yeah. Dig out the steps. See that that gives you all that all those options yeah. to to make sure that you can fit that stone in by actually changing the ground itself versus having to find just the right rock. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Huge, like, yeah. And they've been there 15 years. And they're doing well, they're locked in, but underneath the bottom one, it's really 
like eroding. Okay. Like when you walk up to you can try backfilling it. If you can use the end of a shovel to pack gravel in, okay. that can help. You can also call a professional. I, I don't. Yeah, there you go. So let's try something. We've got plenty of height, but let's think about this from a horticultural What can we do now to make a planting pocket? So we're going to think outside of the box. Now obviously, most of the time when you're building a wall, you're thinking, put those stones tight together. It's got to last a thousand years. But let's, let's say that it's okay for this wall to fail. And there aren't lives at stake. You know, it's not, it's not retaining a Lowe's or a Home Depot parking lot that was built somewhere where it shouldn't have been. It's just, it's here for the plants. That's why we're doing this right now. And so we're not worried about every stone looking perfect except for the edge. But can we make places to put things? So what if we what if we do this? I want to stack this in a way so that weight going down on it also is not trying to push stone out. So if I push stone down like here, so if I put this here, for example, to make a pocket, and I push down like this, it's going to push this stone out. So what you want to do is think about it. If you can do that, it doesn't look stable, but it actually is. And it's doing very little now to push this stone out. And we've got enough room now for a pocket. A little one quart pot and bust the roots up. If it's sunny, you could put a cactus or a sedum or a, you name it. I mean, you go to house, greenhouse four, greenhouse eight, greenhouse 10, there's about 500 different things that you could put in here right now. Go to house six, go to house five, you got about 150, 200 things, it'll go right here, right now. So, we've got a pocket there. That's not bad. Let's see if we can do it. Okay, now we just need to support this, maybe by taking the weight here and touching this spot. But now you've got a pocket here, a pocket here. Make sure we've got plenty of backfill to make this feasible. Would that help it? Would that be enough to... Well, we're gonna see. I don't want to push this one out. We want to make sure it's this point that we have to make sure it doesn't leverage. So one way to do that, if you support it here at any point, it doesn't have to go all the way under it, it just has to be tangent to one little point. Or you can weight down this part here. And that can obviously happen in the next layers. When that compost compresses over time, isn't it going to bend back? Not as much as you think, although you do lose about one-third by volume one -third. of your compost in this situation. It'll settle one-third. And you can backfill it over time. If it's 50% permatill in the first place, if the permatill in the soil can touch itself, it becomes its own grid. It doesn't settle nearly as much. And that's uh, one of the reasons, another reason to use, and gravel will do the same thing, but to use a lot of permatill. Can you, can you, can you resist? <laughs> I, can't, I can't help it, I got a plant. I just, I just recently completed a berm in, the, in my own garden and it's, it's about three times as big as the one I showed you there. I can't help myself, right? And I've been blowing through all my, any money I've got left. I've been buying plants from here and sticking them in there and I can't help it. But Joe, you can plant it right away, um, especially if you have compost and soil that is finished. In other words, when you buy compost, a lot of times it's still what's called hot. It's still decomposing. You can smell it. It still smells like what it came from. And it might take a month or two to really be finished. There we go. Now we have an overhang too. So now, if you have rocks that are big enough, you can start to create overhanging space like what we did over there. There's a lot of plants out there that you can grow in full sun, but in an overhang, now they have enough shade. They have shaded roots and they can grow in those situations. We're actually growing living stone, lithops, over there in that berm as an experiment, but we're finding out that they are perfectly hardy in the teens. 
and we don't know they're low end yet because we haven't found it. But they're allergic to rain. So they get basically dew, humidity, uh, driving mist, splashes occasionally, and they're they're growing way under these things, and they never get a drop of rain in their life. But they've doubled, tripled in size in their first year. They flowered. They're setting seed, all because we have overhangs. Another cyclamen, yeah, I love cyclamen. Yeah, the bigger the rocks. Obviously, the bigger the pockets that are just naturally formed. Um, this is where, again, if you can use a machine to stack the stones, go for it. Um, a skid steer with pallet forks means that the next stone here could be 33 to 3,500 pounds. It can lift that, it can set it in place, and you can do it with your wrists and thumb. That's all it takes. Spend time in nature. Okay. That's, that's where I get that inspiration from. I, I'm, I'm nothing more than a geological plagiarist. All I want to do is, is try, not to, try not to screw up too bad when it comes to copying nature. Anything, anything that I do, nature's just like, hold my beer and, and can do it better. So I just try to, to do the best I can, and, but I study it. Just seeing how nature planted things and uh, how rocks fall into place. Because nature doesn't stack stone like this. Nature basically with ice and volcanic activity and erosion it just kicks them and that's really what it's doing is punting the things and they fall into place I have a question yeah so when we're building this kind of wall mm -hmm. when you get to the edges of where you want it to be do you kind of taper off the height or just you know, instead of having a blunt just like this line ends yeah kind of end your curve? that's up to you and there's a lot of different ways to do it yeah. um you know if you can just dead end into a hillside that's one option sometimes and this is where that the, the plastic edging i was talking about is nice so here the edging your path whatever and imagine a river cutting into a river bluff it's very steep there right that's where your channel is it's probably the best fishing you know but then your edging maybe juts out while this curve continues in so if your garden bed is controlled or defined by a separate edge than the stone face itself and you're able to curve out then this soil can just blow out and you're done so that's that's one option as well is just play it think of, think of the movement of water which is one of the greatest forces in shaping stone it is a stone saw and it does exactly that it will cut the face of this um, just like in any any river situation and then in terms of this dimension, mm -hmm. do you, like, like how vertical do you or do you not want to be? Up to you entirely. It's actually, for me, it's more difficult to stack backwards, to actually give it a pitch. Um, but the way that I've found that I can do it, if I need to go tall and pitch back, I'll do it with pockets. And so that, that, that works out very well. And the higher I get, the bigger these pockets are getting, the more irregular my line is, as long as at no point will a rock, for example, this one, and this is great actually, very good placement, this rock must not break this plane. As long as it doesn't, see this edge, this edge doesn't match this edge anymore. This edge doesn't match this edge anymore. It doesn't matter. You stacked it just fine, and that you've got a pocket now, so you're in full sun, and you could put a shade plant right there if you wanted to. I, you know, would still want to go a little taller because that would that would flip. But there's a reason then to make sure that you don't stack much taller um, than than your soil. So right now I can rake the soil down and I can have the soil come all the way out to here, right? In doing so, that first of all puts a hundred or so pounds of back pressure there but also makes this less enticing as a step. If you can do that and you can't step on it, then it's not a problem anymore. Um, but yeah, it's still, that's not stable. If it were me, I would try to get one big flat rock up here, something, um, but it's not bad either. It's, it's actually very good. And again, you get that edge, and then once you get to this point, it's just freestyle. If it, if it fits, it, it ships. And, that's where we're at. So, 
if you got any more questions, we can certainly end it there. I appreciate you all sticking around for it. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I'm calculating all the money he's going to spend now. <laughs> well, this is uh, this this is um, that's forty dollars in rock right there. That's it. That's forty bucks. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, forty to fifty, and that's that's. Yes, I do. It's Scott Stone, Yonkers. There's there's one on Yonkers, but they've changed their name now. Their main yard is in Mebane, and any one of us can go there. And we can we get our little red tags there, as you see, and you get a sharpie, and you flag them, and uh, a full pallet, and that's going to be this. This was how about one third used, but we bought this pallet, and it it weighed thirty two twenty six. These were a hundred and about 170 a ton. Um, our price, and we're getting a pretty good deal retail, or if you're just buying a couple, it's going to be up around 200 a ton. Um, the machine that delivers them, it'll be on a flatbed trailer, and there'll be a machine on the back. It's a forklift, and as long as you have about a nine and a half foot width, they can get through any terrain, any grade, and they will put that that stack of stone right where you're working. Otherwise, you're moving them yourself. So that's another thing to think about is where I'm building a wall or a berm, can I get machines to it? Oh, it makes such a difference. And I don't know if anybody's used much for machinery, but it, it, it changes the way that you look at what's possible physically. I've been on a skid steer for 20 years now almost, and I wear the thing like an exosuit. It's just part of me. And suddenly my biceps are capable of lifting over 3,000 pounds. And if my mind is plugged into the coordination and the dexterity of my hands to the machines then it's as if i am doing that that's the beauty of it so and you can get a lot bigger than a skid steer but for something like this you just need a skid steer thank you, so thank much. you. yeah take a handful of permatil on your way back and, yeah.